Hi there, my name is Peter Mumby. I'm a professor of coral reef ecology at the University of Queensland. And in this set of talks, we're going to be focusing on local human impacts on tropical coastal ecosystems. Everybody's familiar with the idea that coral reefs are found in idyllic conditions of clear, warm water. And if we look at the whole ecosystem, then in a natural state, you'd expect to find them all living in fairly good conditions like this. But ecosystems have been disturbed for millennia, whether it's cyclones that damage systems, whether it's earthquakes that can shake corals free and knock mangroves over, or even natural flood events that occur when there's a major typhoon that can lead to some sediment running off into the ocean. I mean, in some cases, that sediment can actually sink to the bottom and smother things, and maybe locally that can cause some damage, but often the system is resilient enough to recover from that. And then there's other sorts of problems. Occasionally, you get exceptionally low tides. And when that happens, you can end up with corals being high and dry and dying. But again, given enough time, they'll recover. And lastly, we can think of El Nino events. And these are events that naturally increase the temperature of water around coral reefs. And this can cause coral bleaching. And all of these things are natural disturbances that, with a healthy ecosystem, do not erode its resilience. And so the systems will naturally recover until now. And what we're concerned about now is essentially the impact of humans on ecosystems. Now, some would argue that some impacts started even 12,000 years ago as we started to develop land for agriculture and, and undertake our first sort of agricultural revolution. Many would also argue that this intensified in the uh, industrial revolu revolution that took place about 200 years ago. But what's certainly the case is that for many, many hundreds of years at very least, we've had a profound impact on ecosystems. And we can illustrate that in all sorts of ways. For example, if we look at Christopher Columbus and on his fourth voyage to the Caribbean, when he visited a place that we now call the Cayman Islands, there were so many turtles, he called it Las Tortugas after the turtles. Now this was in 1503. Now, sometime after that, when the areas were governed by colonial powers, they realized there were so few turtles left that they had to rename the islands, and they named them after a kind of crocodile, which is almost extinct now anyhow in that area. So the names of entire countries have changed. But this was a big issue, because uh, in those days, collecting turtles on islands was a very important source of food if you happened to be uh, a mariner. And so people were collecting turtles, they would last for a long time on the boat as a source of food. And therefore there was some concern if the islands were over depleted of their turtle supplies. And as an example, in the island of Bermuda, the colonial government became concerned that the numbers of turtles were diminishing. And in the year 1620, they passed one of the first conservation laws to uh, prohibit the capture of turtles less than 18 inch in carapace size uh, and if you didn't abide by that rule you were fined 15 pounds worth of um, tobacco which was a big deal then it's probably a big deal now today now of course since those times we have continued to develop coastal areas and increase our impacts on those systems and we have now entered what many call the geological era or epoch the anthropocene and this, of course, is named after ourselves and our own impact. And we can see that very clearly by just looking at a, a sort of an accumulation of nighttime imagery of the world. And you can see where human populations are very densely intermingled and how strongly connected we are. So we're going to start by focusing on how we're polluting the environment. Pollution of the environment has been taking place uh, for a very long period of time, and it happens for a number of reasons, principally because we all want to live in the coastal zone. If we look globally, the number of people, this is hundreds of millions of people, living as a function of their distance to the coast is disproportionately high near the coastal zone. Lots of people want to live there. Another way of looking at this is if you look in 2010, there were 130 million square kilometers of land on Earth. And only 5% of it is actually near the coast. But of that 5%, nearly 40% um, nearly of the people on the Earth live within that small area. 
Now, what this means, of course, is that the density of people living at the coast is much, much greater than that living further away from the coast. Compare 100 people per square kilometre near the coast to an average of 38 away from the coast. We live very densely. And of course, this has a number of impacts on the environment. So this here is a satellite image of an area of Honduras. This is coastal Honduras. You can see the water, the, the ocean to the left there, it's that sort of green color. And you can see the deep, dark green areas are actually mangroves. And this little area there is a deep green color, which is a shrimp farm. And this is an image that was taken in 1986. Now, over a period of 13 years, this area has been developed a great deal. We have now far more shrimp farms. And one of the most striking consequences of that is an awful lot more sediment in the ocean. The sea now looks a kind of muddy brown color, and that's because the clearance of large areas of mangrove to provide ponds has led to a lot of soil being washed off into the watershed. This is exactly the kind of problem that we see time and time again throughout the world. A very widespread problem is the erosion of land into rivers. And one of the reasons this happens is if you've removed mangroves. The mangroves are the sort of first line of defense. And if sediment does enter rivers, much of it should get trapped by mangroves. But where we've removed the mangroves, that sediment flows out onto seagrass beds, sometimes even as far as the coral reef. Another reason this can happen is that people might clear mangroves because they want to do some form of agriculture and this is maybe sugarcane. And when you replace mangroves, which are the natural plant on these mud flats, with something like sugarcane, every time there's a rainfall event, a lot of that mud can then run off because it's not being retained by the mangroves. And a lot of that sediment enters the river, it runs offshore. You can imagine it floating around near the surface of the water. And as it does that, it cuts down the amount of sunlight. So even when the storm has passed and you have a normal sunny day, very little of that sunlight is reaching the seabed. It has a negative effect on seagrass because they don't have enough light and also a negative effect on coral reefs. And in some cases, that sediment can then settle onto the bottom and smother things. And that's the final insult, if you like, of having too much sediment run off into the watershed and find its way out to the coastal zone. A second consequence of having a high density of people developing the coastal area is nutrient runoff. And it's principally nitrogen and phosphorus-based nutrients that are finding their way from the land into the rivers during rainfall events and out into the coastal zone. And of course what happens is that many plants actually are somewhat starving in terms of the amount of nutrient available to them. And if you provide more nutrient, they say, great, let's utilize that nutrient and uh, grow a lot faster. So that's the main consequence of adding nutrients into the environment is that plants can grow more vigorously. There are some exceptions to that. In some cases adding uh, very high levels of nutrient can actually poison the growth of some plants but generally we end up with that sort of increase. And over the last 50 years or so the usage of fertilizers has increased tremendously. Over that time period for example nitrogen has increased by about fivefold in terms of the amount we apply to the land, and phosphorus by about threefold. And the increase in that fertilizer use depends on where you are geographically. In developed countries, what you can see here is that we've pretty much leveled off with the amount of fertilizer we add to the system. But in developing countries, we're still increasing the amount of that fertilizer use. And unfortunately, this is a very inefficient process about half of that nutrient that we apply for agricultural purposes finds its way somewhere else into the environment. Now, what that causes, the combined effects of nutrient and sediments is called eutrophication. And this happens uh, in many parts of the world. We end up with more nutrients, for example. One of the first things that happens is that that extra nutrient is entering the water through the rivers, perhaps, is going to be taken up by phytoplankton. And a bloom of phytoplankton itself can be toxic. It can become uh, what we call red tides. But also, by having more phytoplankton in the environment, that reduces the amount of sunlight that reaches the seabed. And therefore, for certain things, certain sorts of plants living on the seabed, this robs them of light and can reduce their growth and have all sorts of negative effects. But it can be more complicated than that. If you have a surplus of plant growth because there's more nutrient, so that's assuming that there's enough light that they can still grow, 
If you have a surplus of that plant growth and you don't have enough animals cruising around consuming it, maybe because you've reduced the number of turtles that are there which would naturally be eating it, then what happens is that much of that plant growth effectively uh, dies rather than being eaten. And then that forms detritus that's broken down by bacteria. Having lots of bacteria in an environment can increase the risk of disease. Furthermore, by having more and more bacteria um, and uh, a greater concentration of detritus and sediment and nutrient, that can increase the stress on animals and plants and make them more susceptible to disease. It can also reduce their reproduction. So the effects can be on multiple different stages of the life history. Now, one of the other effects is that by providing more and more phytoplankton, sometimes this leads to an increase in the number of filter feeding organisms. But if there's far too much phytoplankton and sediment, then this can actually clog those filter feeders, and I'm talking about things like oysters and mussels now, um, and then you can have pretty much nothing surviving there. And so we can actually end up with very profound changes into the ecological structure and the function of marine communities once you start adding all of this nutrient and sediment into the environment. Now, uh, one of the most striking effects of that is that if we end up with, say, a big increase in the amount of dead plant matter, and you've got organic material, whether it's from the phytoplankton or from the seabed becoming um, covered with bacteria, that bacteria respires, and as it does so, it reduces the amount of oxygen in the environment. And when that happens, the system becomes anoxic. We end up with hypoxia. And essentially, those sorts of fish and other animals that are trying to breathe down there just don't have enough oxygen. And what we end up with is dead zones. Now, these dead zones are fairly scarce. If you go back to the early part of the last century, they were almost unheard of. By 1950, there was about three main areas of dead zones in the world. By uh, the present time, or 2010, there was now 479 hypoxic zones known around the world, and a further 228 areas that are considered eutrophic and on their way possibly towards becoming hypoxic. So this is a massive increase in the problem. And uh, what this does is cause local areas where there's very little productivity, very few things can survive in these hypoxic areas. In fact, it's such a big problem that it covers almost a quarter of a million uh, square kilometers of the ocean's surface.